All right, let's bring in former ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, to discuss the latest here. Um, ambassador, it's great to have you with us. I want to ask you about this. Turkey right now is renewing its threat to block Sweden and Finland's NATO membership if it doesn't comply with Turkey's request to extradite terror suspects as part of a memoranda signed in Madrid. Erdogan is now saying that there are 73 people on that list for Sweden, but Sweden's foreign minister, Anlind, says that there is no mention of any list or any numbers in this memorandum. Is Sweden's membership in jeopardy right now, knowing that they've previously denied many of Turkey's requests citing Swedish law? Well, of course, uh, the Turkish parliament needs to ratify, just as all of the uh, different NATO member states need to go through a ratification process. So if they fail to do so, it would indeed block Sweden from joining. Uh, I just view this as another phase of the negotiation. Erdogan didn't want to block them at the summit itself, but he's still trying to use uh, the leverage that he has to, to push on this. I think we have to remember that at a level of principle, Sweden and Finland and Turkey all agree that terrorism is a bad thing and there should be no use of Swedish territory to support terrorism. It is just a matter of getting down to the details. Who are they talking about? What are they accused of? How does that fit under Swedish law? Uh, are Swedish laws strong enough? Uh, those are the sort of things that I think will continue to be discussed for, for some time ahead. Okay, so you're not concerned at this point? Uh, I think that this is going to play out for a while. It's going to take most other countries several months, if not a year, to ratify. So I think the Turks are going to use that time in order to press for concessions or see what they can get. So I don't think that this is, at the moment, standing in the way. There will be another crunch point at some point down the road. President Biden recently said that he supports selling F-16s to Turkey and insists that there is no quid pro quo here. Uh, but do you think that we could see concessions coming from Washington if Sweden's unable to, to deliver on, on this list? Well, I don't think the U.S. can do anything to compensate for Turkey's concerns about terrorism. Uh, they want to see those concerns addressed seriously, and it's up to the Swedes to do that. Separate from that is the issue of F-16s for Turkey, which uh, I agree, actually, with President Biden on this. I think it's a U.S. interest to strengthen our strategic alignment with Turkey. If you stand in Turkey and look around the neighborhood, you see the Black Sea and Ukraine to the north, Russia to the east, Iran, uh, northern Iraq, rest of Iraq, Syria and President Assad, Middle East, Eastern Mediterranean. These are areas where the U.S. and Turkey fundamentally share strategic interests, yet we are not doing everything that we could be doing together to address those strategic interests. I think getting a U.S.-Turkish relationship back on track, including with F-16s, is essential. Uh, you answered my next question there. Um, going back to sort of the NATO membership, is there a scenario that you could envision in which Finland would join, but Sweden would not? And where would that leave Sweden if it yeah. were to come under attack? Would NATO defend Sweden? Well, the Finns and the Swedes have agreed with each other that they will only join or stay out together. Uh, they are making this a pact. Uh, certainly, if you if you just take the hypothetical principles here, it is possible for all the NATO states to ratify Finland and for all but Turkey to ratify Sweden, and therefore Finland is admitted. But that's a ways down the road. I think we're looking six months to a year down the road at the ratification process. So it's a little too much to speculate on that. Finland would certainly be happier if Sweden to its rear was part of NATO as well. Fair enough. Uh, the U.S. right now is sending more military aid to Ukraine, but the criticisms remain right now that weapons and aid are not arriving fast enough to make a difference in the fighting on the ground. What needs to change in order for Kyiv to achieve its goals in Ukraine? Yeah, they need uh, long-range artillery systems, longer range than we've been giving them. I don't, I don't see any reason why we should be putting an artificial limit on the distance of the shells. Um, they need that as soon as possible. The Russians are in a pause right now. They've kind of exhausted themselves. So they're lobbing bombs and artillery, but they're not able to advance any further at the moment. 
this is the time for Ukraine to be striking against their supply lines, their ammunition depots, their fuel, their headquarters, behind those lines, further back. And they need the long-range artillery to do that. Uh, they also need uh, more anti-ship systems. They need help with opening the port of Odessa to get grain shipments out. There's just a lot that is still on the table where we could be doing more and we seem to be doing it piecemeal. How, how much at risk are we right now of losing this opportunity, as you mentioned, for uh, because there have been other opportunities previously for Ukraine to really gain the upper hand here. Um, uh, how do you see this playing out? Well, what this means is by going slow, by, by dabbling in the high Mars, you know, four at a time per month or something like that, um, that is just meaning that more Ukrainian lives are at risk, more Ukrainian cities are shelled, the war drags on longer at greater cost. So we should be pushing it in there as quickly as possible. Does it mean that Russia gets a chance to regroup and maybe go back on the offensive again? Yes, ultimately it does mean that. It might take them six weeks to eight weeks to be able to do that. That's the time we should be using and the Ukrainians should be using to retake territory and strategic locations and make it more difficult for the Russians to reconstitute an offensive capability. Ambassador, one more question before we have to go. President Zelensky has said that they are not prepared to cede territory to end this war. Is that a realistic outcome at this stage in the game? It is. Uh, it absolutely is. Uh, any leader of any country faced with a, a foreign aggressor just coming in and seizing territory is not going to stand in front of his people and say, well, I guess we have to give that away. No, they're going to stand and fight as we would do, as France would do, as Germany would do. And I think it's the only realistic option for Zelensky right now. And as long as they continue to get Western military support and Russia continues to play this poorly, I think they have a realistic chance of achieving that as well. All right. Ambassador Volker, we appreciate you being with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.